ഹലോ ഡിയർ സ്റ്റുഡൻസ് വെൽക്കം ടു യെറ്റ് അനദർ എപ്പിസോഡ് ഓഫ് എസ് ജെസ് ക്ലാസ്സസ് വി ഹാഡ് ബിൻ ഡിസ്കസിങ് മിഡീവൽ ആൻഡ് റുനായ്സൻസ് ലിറ്ററി ക്രിറ്റിസിസം ഇൻ ദ പ്രീവിയസ് ടു വീഡിയോ ലെസൺസ് വി സോ വൈ ദ ലിറ്ററി ക്രിറ്റിസിസം ഓഫ് ദ മിഡീവൽ പീരീഡ് ഹാസ് നോട്ട് ബീൻ എൻ ഏരിയ ഓഫ് മച്ച് റിസർച്ച് ആൻഡ് സ്കോളർഷിപ്പ് വി അനലൈസ്ഡ് ദ ഫ്യൂ ഇമ്പോർട്ടൻസ് important reasons why this area hasn't been of much research and scholarship we saw that the english literary criticism the medieval phase by j w h atkins is perhaps the only credible work pertaining to this particular period we also saw the division of medieval criticism into five stages late classical carolingian high medieval scholastic and humanist we also saw some of the important writers of this period like bede and alcuin john salisbury geoffrey of winsorf john garland and not to mention uh, our very own geoffrey chaucer and dante alighieri so these are the important points that we came across uh, in our discussion of uh, medieval renaissance criticism and then we moved into renaissance literary criticism we saw first of all we understood the movement renaissance then later on we went to discuss some of the popular figures in renaissance such as galileo copernicus uh, thomas hobbes geoffrey chaucer dante etc we discussed the term humanism with which is very much important with respect to uh, renaissance we also came across uh, some of the important uh, areas that were uh, analyzed during this particular period and uh, one of the important tasks the literary critics took uh, in this particular period was to raise uh, objection against the arguments raised by plato in his popular work republic now uh, we also analyzed some of the important uh, figures that come across uh, while learning this particular period we came across names like petrarch scaliger mintuno boccaccio as well as the italian commentators robertello and castel vetro uh, castel vetro is important because he is uh, someone who contributed uh, the second and third unities to the three unities it was aristotle who who uh, spoke about unities first but he spoke about only unity of action and we also uh, came across the five phases through which english literary criticism developed during the uh, renaissance period so these were the important ideas that we discussed in our previous two uh, video lessons in this particular video lesson we will be uh, seeing or looking at uh, sir philip sidney who is the most representative of the renaissance literary criticism uh, this video is divided into three parts in the first session i will give you a short introduction a very brief introduction to uh, philip sidney in the second session we will uh, look at his contributions to literary criticism and in the final section uh, we will uh, see uh, a particular work uh, which is his apology for poetry so let us uh, move into the lesson so let us start with a very brief introduction to sir philip sidney i am making this introduction introduction very brief because we have a lot to discuss with respect to his contributions towards english literary criticism and also with respect to his uh, work an apology for poetry so let us look at uh, the brief introduction to sir philip sidney Sir Philip Sidney was born on November 30, 1554 in Kent, England. He has spent several major works of the Elizabethan era including Astrophel and Stella. Astrophel and Stella is an Elizabethan sonnet cycle. Now a sonnet cycle is a series of sonnets each of which uh, that can stand on its own but when arranged in order tell a loose story of the progress of an affair. the sonnet sequences sequences were popular during elizabethan england and uh, once uh, sidney wrote this it became a fashion throughout the renaissance spirit now he has also written arcadia a heroic prose romance 
in which courtiers disguised as shepherds make love and sing delicate experimental verses. Now, he is not popular for Arcadia or Astrophel and Stella. He is also popular for the contributions towards literary criticism, especially through the work The, the Defense of Poetry. In 1585, Sidney was appointed governor of the Dutch town of Flushing. He fought a battle against the Spanish at Sutphen in 1586 and died of his wounds several days later. He was born in 1554 and he died in 1586. So this is a very short introduction to Sir Philip Sidney. Let's move on to the second part of this video that shall discuss some of the important contributions that he has made with respect to uh, literary criticism. After the classical critics, the name that you come across in the realm of literary criticism is that of Sir Philip Sidney. There are reasons behind this. Let us thereby also understand what are the significant contributions that Sir Philip Sidney has made towards the realm of literary criticism. Now, after Longinus, the name you come across in the realm of literary criticism is that of Sir Philip Sidney. What are available during this vast span of period, which is between uh, the classical criticism and Renaissance criticism, are some rhetorical treatises valuable for historical research. Sidney is possibly the first critic and a critic of lasting significance representing the spirit of Renaissance criticism. Besides being a public servant, he was also a man of letters of great reputation. And that is perhaps why Spencer dedicated his Shepherd's Calendar to him and also honored him in his Astra Fell. You might have also come across Ben Johnson's remark on Sir Philip Sidney. Ben Johnson said he was the one in whom all the muses met. So that is how scholarly, how, that is how pedantic his writings were. Now it is important to analyze uh, Sidney's popularity as a literary critic. Let us look at uh, the background uh, which actually helped his works to be popular. Elizabethan literature was still in its infancy. No great work had come out of England so far. In terms of quality, it was poorer than writings from European countries. Chaucer was perhaps the only poet of whom the English could feel proud. Shakespeare was in his teens. No work of any standing was in existence in drama apart from Gobodak. You have heard this title before, Gobodak. You might have learned it as the first tragedy. So, no other work uh, apart from Gobodak had been of much significance during this period. Uh, Gobodak, which was in itself, uh, it was no piece of dramatic art, but it was only, as you know, a mediocre melodrama. In less than three decades after Sydney's work, England nearly became the cultural capital of Europe. So Sydney's work actually, uh, it was a turning point for literary criticism or the entire literary scene in Europe. In the words of the popular critic Spingern, he is the veritable epitome of the literary criticism of the Italian Renaissance. So, you actually have no wonder why all these important figures like uh, Spencer, Ben Johnson, Spingern, they are pouring in praises for this literary critic because that is how valuable his contributions are towards English literary criticism. Now what Spingern means when he says that he is the variable epitome of literary criticism is that Sidney drew from all the best that was available in Italian Renaissance thought. For example, it was from the Italians that Sidney borrowed the concept of the dramatic unities, the unity of action, time and place. The poet as a second creator, this was also borrowed from the Italian thinkers and critics, and also tragedy as evoking and winning our admiration. So uh, what 
Spingarn men, meant was that Sydney took all that was good uh, from the Italian into the English scene. During the Renaissance, discussion on literature constantly touched just four areas of literary culture. The art of poetry in verse is the first area. Treatises on poetry and poetics, this is the second area that critics focused on. Treatises in the nature of answers specific to specific charges, uh, just like how critics of the Renaissance period gave answers to the charges leveled by Plato against poetry. And finally, apologetic essays in defense of the art of poetry. Sydney's apology belongs to the fourth type. Defenses such as Sydney's were quite popular during the Renaissance. There are instances of such writings by Thomas Lodge and Richard Puttenham. It was a sort of literary genre in which one could talk about the greatness of poetry in general. Now let us look at Sydney's most popular contribution towards English literary criticism, which is his work An Apology for Poetry. You must have understood that your textbook focuses on a representative critic uh, from a particular period and your textbook also discusses one of the popular works uh, that pertain to the realm of literary criticism. With respect to Plato, it was uh, Republic. With respect to Aristotle, it was Poetics. Coming down to Horace, it was his work Art of Poetry and with respect to Longinus, it was his concept of sublimity and the work on the sublime. Now, uh, Sydney's work that has been explored in your textbook is an apology for poetry. Let us look at some of the important information regarding Sydney's an apology for poetry. We are not quite certain as to when Sidney's apology was composed. It was probably written in 1583, though it was published in 1595 posthumously, which means after death. The treatise bears two titles because his work was published in two separate editions by two separate writers. The first part, The Defense of Poesy, was published by William Ponsonby and the second part, An Apology for Poetry, was published by Henry Olney. Now let's see why uh, Philip Sidney wrote this particular defense. Stephen Gosson's vitriolic attack in his long-titled pamphlet, School of Abuse, containing a pleasant invective against poets, pipers, players, Justers and such like caterpillars of the Commonwealth in 1579, denouncing works of literature as the works of the devil, occasioned Sydney's spirited rebuttal. So it was against this particular pamphlet that Sir Philip Sidney wrote an apology for poetry. Gosson was given a fitting but untitled reply by Thomas Lodge in the same year. However, Lodge does not offer enough justification for art from a purely literary perspective. Ironically enough, Gosson's pamphlet was dedicated to the right noble gentleman, Master Philip Sidney Esquire. So you see that the arguments raised by Stephen Gosson, which is actually an attack on art as such he even goes to the extent of calling uh, works of literature as the works of devil and this particular was uh, work was dedicated to sir philip sydney so even though thomas lord gave an apt reply sir philip sydney found it very necessary to reply to his arguments now apology falls into seven broad divisions it is carefully crafted in the form of a rhetorical argument. Sidney follows the general oratorical method made up of narration, proposition and proof. So it's more or less in the form of a speech. Apology falls into seven broad divisions. Exodium, which means the introduction. 
narration describing the antiquity of poetry how ancient this art form is and how various philosophers in the beginning had uh, depended on this art form this medium to express themselves the third is proposition uh, that poetry is imitation the fourth is division he divides poetry into religious philosophic imitative he gives proof for his arguments the sixth is refutation he speaks against the charges leveled against art and poetry by stephen gosson in this and finally comes peroration or conclusion now sydney is said to have applied the ciceronian principle of oratory to his method of developing the arguments this particular principle uh, uses arguments which are interspersed with recapitulatory perorations that means summarizing uh, you summarize at frequent intervals so that you know uh, the the listeners or the readers will get a clear understanding of the the argument that you are raising now such a method or form enables him to maintain the sequence of his argument and thereby not lose the con- control over the subject it saves him from the sin of prolixity or boring talking the treatise opens with a prologue about the need for vindicating poetry if poetry is subject to condemnation it would mean that a nation's culture and its heritage are the real target so Uh, Philip Sidney equates poetry with the nation's culture and heritage and he also asks the question were not the philosophers and statesmen of your primarily poets and other things only afterwards so these are rhetorical questions that you find in the work sidney then goes on to give a definition for poetry he states that poet is the maker and poetry is the art of representation He also discusses different divisions of poetry like the pastoral, elegiac, iambic, satiric, comic, tragic, lyric and heroic and goes on to defend poetry against the charges leveled against this. According to Sidney, poetry is not immoral, only its abuse is immoral. What Plato spoke against was the improper use of poetry. Sidney says the fault actually does not rest with poetry but with the practitioners of the art sidney also surveys the poetic scene in england beginning from chaucer and bemoans the degeneracy of drama as reflected in gobodak which violates the essential unities so vital in dramatic composition he discusses the function of tragedy the comedy and the lyric sidney may be regarded as the first dramatic creed critic His conception of tragedy is an amalgamation of medieval notions and Aristotle's doctrine. The classicist in Sydney is offended by the indiscriminate and purposeless intermingling of tragedy and comedy and also by the deviation from the principle of three unities. As I said earlier, Aristotle is the one who spoke about uh, unity of action and it was later on the Italian critic Casavetro who added in the two uh, unities two other unities then he goes on to discuss uh, the diction and style in poetry and uh, he does this with reference to those who do not employ a natural style but are carried away by conceits sidney also discusses prosody uh, glorifying the english language with which has both the rhymed and unrhymed facilities built into its nature and system the treatise concludes with robes claims of the greatness of poetry as an object fit for veneration now sydney's main objective in or by writing this treatise was to show the true value of poetry and he does it by presenting to us a picture of the past So this is an outline uh, to uh, Sir Philip Sidney's an apology for poetry. I hope you have an understanding regarding the critic as well as his uh, work an apology for poetry. With this we come to the end of this video lesson. In the next video lesson we will be moving into module 3. 
I will see you in the next video lesson. Thank you.